Hi, I'm Al Meltzer, sitting in for Pat Summerall and Tom Brookshire, neither of whom could make it this week. All season, Pat and Tom have been showing you from two to four minutes of the best action from each of the previous week's games. But this week will be a little different. Since there were just the four conference playoff games last week, we'll go into each of those four games in some detail and from more different camera angles. And then I'll try to decide for the waiting pro football world out there which of last week's four winners will go on to the Super Bowl and even who will win the big one at Rice Stadium. I'll be back with all of the best action from last week's four playoff games right after this message. Last Saturday in Bloomington, Minnesota, it looked for a half as though the Vikings were too rusty to match George Allen's well-prepared Washington Redskins. I guess in a way being the earliest to clinch a division title might be more of a disadvantage than an advantage. But fortunately for the Vikings, the rust wore off eventually. Bloomington, Minnesota became an NFL city in 1961. And ever since 68, the Vikings have been a strong contender for the Super Bowl. But except for 1969, when Minnesota won the NFC Championship, the Vikings' playoff record has been 0-5, including three playoff losses in a row, and last year the Vikings didn't even get to the playoffs. But this season has been a different story, as the Vikings lost only twice, and not at all at home. And with Fran Tarkenton and John Gilliam each heading into their first playoff game, the sky seemed the limit for Minnesota. But against George Allen's playoff-ready Redskins, a strange thing happened. The Vikings were tight. While Fran Tarkenton and John Gilliam missed out on the game's first touchdown, fortunately for the Vikings, the Redskins' Billy Kilmer and Charlie Taylor were having their problems as well. Charlie Taylor is one of the great all-time pro pass receivers, but in the first half against Minnesota, he didn't look like it. On one reception, he was sandwiched by Nate Wright and Jeff Seaman, and the Vikings had an opportunity to score what could have been the game's all-important first point. Despite Jeff Seaman's run back, the Vikings could not take advantage of their scoring opportunity, and soon after, Billy Kilmer and Roy Jefferson hooked up to give the Redskins their first scoring chance. Unfortunately for the Redskins, Kurt Knight missed an easy field goal, and the game remained scoreless until Fran Tarkenton found running back Oscar Reed, number 32, with a play which finally set up a Fred Cox field goal and a three to nothing lead for Minnesota. All season long, in fact, ever since George Allen took over three years ago, the Redskins special teams have indeed been special. So it really came as no surprise when a muffed punt turned into a scoring chance for Washington. Taking advantage of the rare Minnesota miscue, Billy Kilmer immediately sought out the man who had been having his problems, Charlie Taylor, number 42. Taylor hung on tight this time, and his catch set up another scoring opportunity for the league's leading touchdown man, Larry Brown, number 43. Despite controlling play for most of the first half, the Redskins led the Vikings by only 7-3 at halftime. But the way things were going for the Redskins, it was indeed a welcome lead.
In the second half, the Vikings came out charging on the legs of Oscar Reed, number 32. Oscar Reed had turned a third and two situation into a 46 yard gain to the Washington two yard line. In a replay from the end zone, we can more fully appreciate the work of the man whose slipperiness earned him the nickname of the Sea, and who for the game totaled 171 yards rushing and receiving. From the two, Tarkenton call on the old war horse, number 30, Bill Brown. Brown's touchdown put the Vikings ahead 10 to 7, and the Minnesota fans had a chance to warm themselves with the excitement of the moment. Billy Kilmer, who earlier in the week had been hospitalized with a stomach disorder, showed no signs of disability as he brought the Redskins right back, getting the ball to Larry Brown every chance he got. Larry Brown did not have a 100-yard rushing day this year until the final week of the regular season. But last week, he made it two in a row as he ran 29 times for 115 yards against the rugged Minnesota defense. Watch number 58, Wally Hilgenberg, set up a drive stopper. And then watch the knee of number 31, Charlie Haraway, as he feels some pressure from Bobby Bryant. Twice when the Vikings had stopped third quarter drives, Kurt Knight, who earlier had missed badly, was called in to kick from 42 and 52. And again, Washington led 13 to 10. Trailing once more, Fran Tarkenton and John Gilliam took over the game. On a replay, we can see that Tarkenton faked to number 44, Chuck Foreman, and then found Gilliam floating free behind the Redskins' nickel defense. On the next play from scrimmage, Billy Kilmer tried to ignite another Redskin drive with a pass to Roy Jefferson. But lurking in the shadows was Viking cornerback Nate Wright, number 43. Suddenly, the Vikings were within striking distance again, and one play later, Fran Tarkenden pulled a page from his earlier days in Minnesota. In a replay from the end zone, we can see the kind of pressure Fran Tarkenden can apply even to the most experienced defense in the league. For the day, John Gilliam caught only two passes, but both were for touchdowns within one minute's time, and suddenly the Vikings led 24-13. But just as suddenly, following a block punt, Billy Kilmer passed to Roy Jefferson in the end zone, and again the lead was down to four at 24 to 20.
In the replay, watch Billy Kilmer's pass protection and then notice how closely Jefferson was covered by Nate Wright, number 43. In the waning seconds, Kilmer again had the Redskins knocking on the door. But on fourth down from the Viking 42, Kilmer threw incomplete. And the Viking victory was assured, as was apparent to two Vikings, both of whom were right. Nate and Jeff, that is. For the fans of the Minnesota Vikings, everything was once again right with the world. Or how better to keep warm through the Minnesota winter than by rooting for your favorite team and maybe following them to Texas, first to Dallas, and then perhaps to Houston for the big one, the one that got away in 1969. When the Pittsburgh Steelers met the Oakland Raiders earlier this year, not only did the Men of Steel defeat pro football's dynamic organization 17 to 9 in Oakland, but they added insult to injury when they accused the silver and black of greasing up their jerseys, deflating the football and other misdemeanors. All of which is the stuff that heated rivalries are made of. The arrow points to Oakland, California, and the sign says world champs, but last week the only bona fide world champions in Oakland were the A's, a baseball team. And the Pittsburgh Steelers of the NFL had traveled the width of this nation with one idea. To make sure that the people of Oakland in a single year would not be able to lay grandiose claim to the title of world champion in both of America's most honored sports. For the Pittsburgh Steelers, the journey had been much lengthier than just across the country. For almost four decades, the Steelers had lain as doormats before NFL powerhouses until last year when the men of steel had shed their mild-mannered Clark Kent ways and climbed over the Oakland Raiders into the American Conference Championship game. And now for the second year in a row, the Pittsburgh Steelers had earned the right to vie for all the honor in the pro football world. And for the second year in a row, the Steelers' first challenge in the Super Series would be the Oakland Raiders. If Oakland fans appeared to be blowing their own horn prematurely, their pride was understandable. For in six of the past seven seasons, the silver and black had earned a berth in the playoffs. But though the attitude of the Raiders and their fans seemed to be one of confidence, there must have been some doubts. For while the Raiders were Western Division champions, the Steelers, as the wild card team in the playoffs, actually had the better record for 1973, and Pittsburgh had defeated Oakland in each of their past three meetings. Prior to the game, the Raiders had stated that if they were to score against Pittsburgh, it would have to be with defense and special teams because they felt it was impossible to dent the steel curtain with sustained drives. But in their very first possession, the Raiders went to ball control tactics, and this 20-yard sweep by Marv Hubbard showed just how clearly Oakland had taken control of the line of scrimmage. Grinding out yardage in sizable chunks, the Raiders ate up almost 10 minutes of the first quarter, accomplishing what they themselves had called the impossible. And on the 16th play, Marv Hubbard smashed the final yard, capping an 82-yard drive to give the Raiders a 7-0 advantage. Unable to establish a running game, Terry Bradshaw got the Steelers moving late in the period when he hit Dave Williams for this 14-yard gain into Oakland territory. But two plays later, number 60, Otis Sistrunk deflected this Bradshaw aerial, and Oakland's Phil Villapiano caught it on the carom to end the Steelers' advance. Beginning the second quarter, Kenny Stabler dumped this pass to Mike Ciani for a 21-yard gain to the Pittsburgh 35-yard line. But the Oakland offensive ended 
when Kenny Stabler was trapped for a 10-yard loss and the Raiders had to settle for a 10-0 edge after a 25-yard field goal by George Blanda. Having been held in check for more than 25 minutes, Terry Bradshaw finally got the Pittsburgh attack in gear with this good throw for 24 yards to Preston Pearson. Aided by a roughing penalty, Pittsburgh penetrated the Raiders 10 and then Bradshaw hit Barry Pearson with this pass, putting the Steelers on the board with two minutes remaining in the first half. A repeat shows that Pearson appears to be guided out of bounds shy of the end zone, but the official ruled that he did break that imaginary pane of glass. The Raiders' lead was narrowed to 10-7, wiping out the significance of most of Oakland's first half heroic. Although the Raiders were the dominant team for most of the first 30 minutes, rolling up 10 first downs to Pittsburgh's five, and rushing for 105 yards while holding the Steelers to a mere 34 net yards on the ground, the Silver and Black had relatively little to show for their efforts on the scoreboard, and it appeared that Pittsburgh had weathered a rocky start. Beginning the third quarter, Kenny Stabler moved the Raiders into field goal range the first two times Oakland owned the football, and George Blanda paid off those efforts with field goals of 31 and 22 yards, boosting the Raiders' lead to 16 to 7. But no terminal harm had been done to the Steelers' cars, and then lightning struck in the form of Willie Brown. Eschewing the running game and going up top to get the Steelers moving, Terry Bradshaw aimed a pass for Preston Pearson, but Willie Brown, making the play of the day, stepped into action and returned the stolen football 54 yards for a 23-7 advantage. A repeat of the play shows that the confident Oakland cornerback was playing the ball and not the man, and his gamble paid off when Bradshaw's throw was slightly underneath its target. An isolated look at Brown on the play prior to his interception shows that Bradshaw had sent number 83, Barry Pearson, by Brown to draw the Raiders' corner out of the flat area. But on the next play, never taking his eyes off the quarterback, Willie Brown refused to pick up Pearson and played the ball instead. Brown's game-breaking play left Terry Bradshaw with no other option but to throw. And following the ensuing kickoff, two plays later, Bradshaw put the ball again in the air with the same result. A repeat of the play shows that Bradshaw overshot his intended receiver, Frank Lewis, and that the Raiders' number 43, George Atkinson, playing deep like a center fielder, picked the ball off easily. Number 23, Charlie Smith, then swept left for 40 yards deep into Steeler territory. But the Raiders could not push it across, and at the top of the fourth quarter, George Blanda booted a 10-yarder, making good on his fourth field goal of the day. Blanda's boot made the score 26-7, and Pittsburgh looked beaten embarrassingly early as the Raiders' hungry defenders swarmed all over the Pittsburgh attack. But showing the resilience that characterizes good football teams, the Steelers stubbornly tightened up their pucker straps and began to move the football for all the glory it would bring. Using number 33, Frenchy Fuqua, primarily, the Steelers began to slice away sizable gains. 
showing the class that carried them through the difficult season and into the playoffs. Faced with third and 25 at the Raiders 26, Bradshaw stepped out of the pocket and found Frank Lewis with position on George Atkinson. Lewis's catch made the score Oakland 26, Pittsburgh 14 with 9.05 remaining. But whatever thoughts the Steelers might have had of a miracle finish were soon put to rest. With Marv Hubbard doing most of the work, the Raiders ended the day the way they began it, blowing the mighty steel curtain defenders right off the line of scrimmage. As the Steelers coach Chuck Noah was to say later, Willie Brown's interception was the key play, but no one play ever beats you. They beat hell out of us all day on every play. They blew us out. With 35 seconds remaining, Marv Hubbard gained his 91st yard for the day, smashing over to give Oakland a very satisfying 33-14 victory over the Pittsburgh Steelers. Keeping alive the grandiose dream in Oakland of double dynastic domination in professional football and Major League Baseball. But this was a day for the silver and black. The day struck with pride and poise, like the California sunset, which served only to remind the Oakland Raiders of their upcoming date in Miami. We'll be right back with the second half of This Week in Pro Football following station identification. To my way of thinking, the Cincinnati Bengals had the toughest opening draw in last week's playoff round. Not only were they up against the world champion Miami Dolphins, but they were up against 75,000 vociferous Miami Rooters. So for a young team on their way up, it was a stern test to see if they could keep their orange helmets from being squeezed into orange juice in the Orange Bowl. Despite signs of outward beauty, this is not a friendly place. Rather, it is a place where visitors seldom come away as winners. But last week in Miami, Paul Brown and his Bengals were as ready as they could be after winning their last six in a row and emerging as AFC Central champions. As for Don Shula's Dolphins, a recent and deceptive loss to the Baltimore Colts was no indication of their awesome power. Miami took control on the first series as they shunted Mercury Morris outside for good yardage. Then, mixing his plays perfectly, Bob Greasy hit Mr. Smooth, Paul Warfield. With only five and a half minutes gone in the game, Greasy zipped a slant into Warfield and Miami led seven to nothing. It was enough to bring the white handkerchiefs out as Dolphin fans sensed a rout. A repeat of the touchdown shows the excellent catch Warfield had to make, although the timing on the play was perfect. Despite the white handkerchiefs, the Bengals weren't about to surrender. Number 19, Essex Johnson went up the middle for good yardage. But the Cincinnati star was star-crossed this day as a clean hit caused him an injury to his knee that finished his effectiveness for the game. However, his run helped get Cincinnati on the board with a field goal. Essex wasn't the only Bengal feeling the crunch of the Miami defense as more than once quarterback Ken Anderson was pummeled to the ground. But while Anderson's troubles were with the opposition, Bob Greasy's very few problems came from his own teammates who may lapse occasionally from the boredom of sheer perfection. And 
and sheer perfection was the only way to describe Greasy's stout protection. It gave him loads of time all afternoon. And number 88, Jim Mandich, made up for his miscue soon thereafter, and the Dolphins threatened again. Two bursts up the middle by the crusher named Larry Zunka made it 14 to three and the handkerchiefs were out in earnest. The Dolphins continued to drown the Bengals in offense as once again Greasy went to the incomparable Paul Warfield. Barraging from all angles, Greasy gave to the wing wonder and Mercury flashed in to make the score 21 to three. Surely the young Bengals would give up the ghost. But with a poise beyond their years, they regrouped behind number 66, Bill Berge and brick wall the Miami running game. Greasy tried to counter by returning to the airways. But then a flash of black and orange homed in, stole the pass and blitzed 45 yards to put the Bengals back in the game. A repeat shows that number 34, Neil Craig, had the play red from the start. And his score not only brought his team to within 11 at 21-10, but it also lit some fires. Number 18, Charlie Joyner, had his flame almost snuffed as he made a great catch despite some concentration wrecking. A repeat of the play certainly makes you wonder how Joyner ever managed to hold on, but he seemed unfazed by it all. Ken Anderson added his share to the Cincinnati resurgence by scrambling his team close enough for another horse Muleman field goal to trail at only 21-13. Then on the next kickoff, Mercury Morris couldn't find the handle and the charged up Bengals special team recovered the ball. Although the touchdown by number 55, Jim LeClaire was no good, the Bengals got another field goal four seconds before the half ran out and what had begun as a Miami romp had now become a 21-16 thriller. With the start of the second half, the cavalcade of Cincinnati points was abruptly concluded when Dick Anderson showed up at the other end of Ken Anderson's rainbow to put the Dolphins deep in Bengal territory. Three plays later, the dispassionate Dolphin signal caller Bob Greasy set up and connected with wide receiver Marlon Briscoe on the Cincinnati 17-yard line. From there, Greasy turned Larry Zunka loose on a true workhorse run. Following Zonka's bruising burst, 
Greasy took advantage of the Bengals by slipping tight end Jim Mandich over the middle for an embarrassingly easy score that moved the Dolphins out 28 to 16. One series later, the relentless Dolphin attack continued as Greasy and Paul Warfield combined to put Garo Upremian in position to score. The 50-yard effort was good, and the Dolphins pulled out by 15 points. Behind by two touchdowns, Ken Anderson's efforts to recoup were thwarted by Miami's irrepressible rush. Indeed, the defensive might of both clubs was amply demonstrated as seen when Miami attempted an uncharacteristic act of deception. Tommy Casanova took this one away from Warfield, but the Bengals' offense sputtered to a halt. The Miami offense, however, was a case study in execution as Morris and Zonka put your premium in range for three more points. And as Ken Anderson said, we couldn't break through the 3-4 defense once we got behind as far as we did. And number 36, Lenville Elliott's treatment certainly underscores his point. Unfortunately for the three-year Bengal quarterback, however, the no-names didn't seem to have much of a problem breaking through to him as he was sacked five times. The Dolphins capped the game with a time-consuming and respectfully non-scoring 12-play drive that ended on the Bengal 11-yard line. Jim Kick spearheaded the effort, but his late-game enthusiasm was obviously not appreciated by the frustrated Bengals. The 34-16 defeat was a crushing blow to the young Cincinnati club, yet their 10-4 record and AFC Central Division crown will no doubt subtract some of the agony from their playoff elimination. For Don Shula, however, it was the third time in as many years his team has moved into competition for the AFC title and one step closer to a second consecutive Super Bowl sojourn. But last Sunday's victory was obviously an emotional one for Shula because the coach across the field this time was a man that he had played for over 20 years ago and who had in many ways influenced his coaching philosophy in life. And when the former student and teacher met at midfield, the honest feelings that live in this game of pro football were never more apparent. In a rematch of the thriller from the season's fifth week, the Dallas Cowboys and the Los Angeles Rams collided in Texas Stadium last Sunday for the right to advance to the NFC Championship. In the first Ram-Cowboy encounter, Los Angeles came away with a 37-31 victory. John Hadle had led the offensive barrage as he completed 12 passes for a spectacular 279 yards. Since coming to the Rams from the Chargers, Hadle along with wide receiver Harold Jackson, who caught four touchdown passes in the earlier Cowboy contest, has provided the big explosive scoring punch for the Rams. The key in the rebuilding of the Rams has been head coach Chuck Knox, who built a 12 and two season for their first conference title since 1969. Tom Landry's decision to stay with Cowboy signal caller Roger Staubach has paid off as Staubach led the NFC in passing while leading the Cowboys to the playoffs. The key to the game for the Cowboys was the silencing of the throwing arm of John Hadle, and from the onset, the Cowboys executed.
Number 55, Leroy Jordan grabbed the pass in front of Ram tight end Bob Klein. Watch in an end zone replay as Jordan's perfect timing lulled John Hadel into thinking Klein was open. Stahlbach used number 35, Calvin Hill, to move this one for 15 yards. Two plays later, Hill gave Dallas the lead. Cowboy defense responded on the ensuing series, forcing Lawrence McCutcheon to cough up the ball, which number 20 Mel Renfro recovered. On two key third down situations, Staubach used timely scrambles to net big first downs while moving the Cowboys to the Ram four yard line. Number 12 then timed a perfect spiral to rookie Drew Pearson and a 14 to nothing advantage. The Rams couldn't convert on a Calvin Hill fumble which brought them excellent field position, missing their second field goal attempt. Roger Staubach brought the Cowboys out looking to increase their lead, finding Gene Fugit for 38 yards. The Ram defense rose to stop the Cowboy threat as Staubach was forced out of the pocket and then dropped by number 85, Jack Youngblood. Dallas came away with only a field goal and a 17 to nothing lead. Then the thunder finally struck as Hadel unleashed a lightning bolt to Harold Jackson for 40 yards. The Rams managed a field goal but got a break when on the next series Dave Elmendorf nabbed a deflected Staubach pass. Once again, however, eight plays could bring the Rams but a David Ray field goal which sent Los Angeles to the dressing room without a touchdown and trailing 17 to 6 to the Dallas Cowboys. Realizing that any slip-up against the explosive Los Angeles offensive unit could cost them a shot at the NFC title, the Dallas Cowboys set out in the second half to defend their 11-point lead. Except for the two gift touchdowns, the Ram defense had kept the Cowboy offense in check, and they continued to do so in the second half. So effective was the Ram defense that Dallas could manage just two first downs in the third quarter. But the Cowboys' offensive futility was matched by the Rams, who could not take advantage of three excellent field position situations. The first was set up on Jim Bertelson's 30-yard punt return.
Bertelson's return carried to the Ram 49, but the Rams' drive from that point yielded minus two yards. Later in the quarter, the Ram defense again set up the offense when Staubach got good protection and thought he had Pearson open, but middle linebacker Jack Reynolds intervened at the last moment. Reynolds' interception started a Ram drive from their own 47, but it ended there, too, without gaining a yard. The Ram offense finally got started when Hadel found Jack Snow for 50 yards. Snow's catch set up a field goal try, but for the third time, David Ray missed a makeable field goal. Later, Ray did hit one, but Los Angeles trailed early in the fourth quarter, 17 to nine. Dallas's lead was built on the two early game breaks, but the Cowboys, in the spirit of the season, then returned one of the gifts. Calvin Hill's fumble was recovered by Fred Dreyer. Hill suffered a dislocated elbow on the play, and Los Angeles had possession inside the Dallas 20. Two plays after Hill's fumble, Tony Baker battled in, and thanks to the NFC's best defense, the Rams were back in the game. It was truly the Los Angeles defense that had kept them in the game. They couldn't be faulted on the Cowboys' two touchdowns and had themselves set up the Rams' only scores. Los Angeles had gallantly battled from a 17-0 deficit and trailed now 17-16. But Staubach quickly scuttled the comeback when he hung tough in the pocket and hit Pearson with a perfect pass between Steve Fries and Eddie McMillan. Staubach to Pearson was good for 83 yards and as suddenly as the Rams had come back, just as suddenly were they knocked back out of the game. Drew Pearson, a free agent before the season and a third stringer for most of the year, had caught just two passes in the game, but both were for scores. Pearson's father had named his son after the famous columnist. And now in the biggest game of his career, Drew Pearson had written headlines of his own. Calvin Hill, dislocated elbow and all, had run downfield to congratulate Pearson, for all the Cowboys were confident of the doomsday defense's ability to jam the Ram offense for the remainder of the game. The Rams' last chance ended with a Hadel fumble recovered by Harvey Martin. The turnover led to a Tony Fritch field goal that brought the final score to 27-16 Dallas and extended the Cowboys season for yet another game. But the Rams' loss could not tarnish the outstanding season that they had just completed. For John Hadel and the Rams, a remarkable season was over. Chuck Knox, in his first season as head coach, had led the Rams to 12 victories, the most wins in one season in their history. 1973 may be the start of a playoff appearance streak for the Rams, but it will be difficult to match that of the Cowboys. For eight straight years, the Cowboys have made it into postseason play. The Cowboys season continues, but if it is to go any further, they must beat the Minnesota Vikings, who the Cowboys next play for the National Football Conference Championship. Well, it's time to pick the big ones. Tom was 42 and 38, and Pat 50 wins 30 defeats. In the NFC Championship, Minnesota at Dallas. My selection is Dallas. In the AFC Championship, Oakland at Miami, I go with the Dolphin. And who's going to win the biggest one of all on January 13 in Houston? The boys left me with their choice, and I can't wait to see it. <laughs> the Houston Oilers. Oh, well. To be serious, folks, right? Got to pick the Miami Dolphins to repeat as last year's champion. Just too deep, too much going for them. At any rate, we won't be back next week, and we will be back next season. 
to show you all the best action from next year's World of Pro Football. So for Pat Summerall and Tom Brookshire, and from all of us here at This Week in Pro Football, do have a great 1974. I'm Al Meltzer, and we'll see you all next year. Brought to you by West Clocks, a division of General Time, a tally industries company. Promotional consideration provided by Best Western Motels. There are over 1,250 Best Western Motels located in more than 900 cities throughout the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And by American Airlines. If the sun is shining there, chances are American flies there. From the Caribbean to California to the South Pacific, American Airlines to the good life. Program materials for this week in pro football travel via REA Air Express.